Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you can hear me. Um, <clears throat> my name is uh, Darren Breen from iMedicare Limited. I'm the director and owner of iMedicare, which is a pelvic health device specialist since 2004. So in fact, we celebrate our 20th year of trading this year, uh, just a few weeks ago. So thank you for joining the Ephenomia Academy. This is the first in a series of four lectures. Today, we're going to have a very brief dive into the causes of stress incontinence, the kind of management solutions that are available to patients, and of course, look at the use of the Ephemia bladder support. Incidentally, we will be recording the session. It will be available on our webpage, on the same page that promoted the webinar. Um, so if you if you're need to run off to work or something, don't panic, we will have a recording. So let's look at the prevalence of stress incontinence. It is by some margin, the most prevalent type of incontinence in women affecting up to or at least one in five of all women at some point in life and perhaps as many as three in five, depending on the country and the context. So the issues start at a relatively young age, correlated highly with uh, childbirth and a vaginal delivery, as we shall see in a moment. And it comes with it, uh, obviously, a high degree of um, comorbidities. It can lead to depression, anxiety, poor performance in the workplace. It can interfere with the ability to form social or sexual relationships and generally impact on confidence. And the most important thing is the fact that the silent majority do not seek help. So we see many ladies at lifestyle shows, recently the Menopause Live and the Running Show, and they've never sought professional help for their stress and continence. Uh, all too many women accept it as a natural part of womanhood when of course it isn't. And we're trying to change that. We're trying to encourage ladies to find help and support and seek treatment. So vaginal delivery of a child is by far the number one risk factor for stress urinary incontinence. <clears throat> so you can see on this chart, which was an assessment of over 15,000 ladies in Norway and comparing ladies who've never had a child with a cesarean birth and a vaginal delivery. So you can see that the prevalence of stress and continence for ladies with no delivery or cesarean delivery is quite closely correlated. Um, but once you have a vaginal delivery, the risk of stress and continence doubles or triples depending on age. And of course that increases with the more children that you have. And it's relatively easy to understand when you think of the large baby head moving through a fairly narrow vaginal corridor, stressing and stretching ligaments and muscle tissues, leading to possible damage in levator ani, and pedendal nerve damage, and possible episiotomy, all of which can have a fairly lasting impact um, during or after the pregnancy. So the, the pregnancy itself, is a risk factor in so much as the hormone profile changes, the increase in progesterone reduces muscle tone and increases um, the laxity of connective tissue and ligaments. And of course, the weight of the baby uh, bearing down with increasing force throughout the gestation can be very problematic. Um, so it distorts shape and support, natural support. Chronic coughing is a major factor conditions like smoker's cough, chronic obstructive lung disease, um, up to 64% of women suffer stress incontinence with a severe fit of coughing. Obviously, severe obesity is a factor with the additional weight pressing down on the abdominal continent content. And then menopause um, can exacerbate the problem, again, because of the hormone profile change. So the, the decreasing production of estrogen can impact on muscle tone quality and connective tissue laxity. Um, we also see an increase in urge incontinence at this time. Uh, sorry, uh, chronic constipation is the straining on the abdominal wall. And of course, uh, impact incontinence is another big factor. Up to 40% of, of women of all ages and including professional athletes who are otherwise very fit and well can suffer from impact incontinence. And so when they hit the floor with incredible force, the intra-abdominal pressure can increase by as much as 23 kilopascals. So because of the short urethra, two inches, four centimeters in women, the hypermobility of the urethra can lead to a change in the urovesical angle and 
urine can escape. Um, and of course, connective tissue disorders like scleroderma, lupus, morphine syndrome are also risk factors. So this interesting chart um, maps out the prevalence of the main types of incontinence in women through age. And so you've got stress incontinence, urge incontinence, and mixed incontinence. And straight away, you can see on the top line, stress incontinence is the most prevalent with a linear increase through time up until the age of 40. And this is very highly correlated with the child's birthing process, especially that these have two or three or more children increase their risk factor. Then it appears to plateau and drop off after the menopause. Now, this is actually not true. In reality, the prevalence of urge incontinence is increasing after the menopause because of the impact of a declining estrogen. Bladder elasticity decreases, and that leads to an increasing prevalence of urgency. So these ladies actually have mixed incontinence. They still have stress incontinence, but now they have the added problem of urge incontinence to deal with. <clears throat> So ladies who do um, seek help will often turn to the internet. There are many uh, support charities, uh, Bladder Health, Bladder and Bowel UK, the NHS has a lot of online resources, uh, but ultimately a patient will seek a definitive solution through a healthcare professional, either in the context of the NHS or privately. And when a diagnosis has been made, of course, the gold standard solution is pelvic floor exercises which will lead to a successful resolution in the vast majority of ladies, which is what we all want to see. But occasionally they fail either because the lady is not completely certain how to do the pelvic floor exercises or they have poor compliance. They give up too easily and they're not using, they're not doing the exercises frequently enough. Um, most ladies will be aware of disposable incontinence pads, of course, but very often they will be self-funded at considerable expense. So generally, ladies are not that aware of intravaginal supports, which is where, of course, the healthcare professional comes into play. Um, Ephemia, as we shall see, is a very useful resource in the management of stress incontinence, both in the shorter and longer term. Surgical interventions such as bulking agents or uh, tension-free vaginal tape tend to be um, left to the most severe cases where pelvic floor exercises are, are not going to work. Um, and the, of course, there are risk factors associated with the invasive procedure. Bulking agents tend to have to be repeated intermittently. Um, we currently see a moratorium on the tension-free tape because of the risk of erosion and migration of the tape itself, leading to urination difficulties in the longer term. Autologous sling is still a possibility, but it's not suitable for every single patient. Um, and in fact, there is a school of thought that ephemia could be used as a proof of concept for the autologous sling. So let's look a little bit more at ephemia <clears throat> um, bladder support. It really should be called ephemia midurethral support, as we shall see. So it comes in three different sizes designed to be positioned into the vagina. The two support rings have the same distance apart as the width of a tension-free tape. And they're designed to press on the urethra at the same integral point that a transvaginal tape would press, um, which will optimize the efficiency, as we shall see in a moment. Very easy to clean, made of soft medical grade silicone. They're sustainable, <clears throat> so each device can be used for up to 16 hours per day without the need for removal. Um, if the patient is using the correct size, they should be able to urinate without needing to take the device out. And if they're used all day, every day, a device would normally last a full three months. Um, in reality, patients often use them intermittently, so a single device can last longer than that. Of course, the device is uh, medical grade, class 2B, uh, CE licensed device and an innovation of Sweden, which is a mark of quality, uh, as we can all agree. So who is the Ephemia bladder support suitable for? Well, it's designed only to manage stress urinary incontinence, not any other type of incontinence. And ideally, the lady would be able to insert and remove the device on their own. It's a self-managed home use device. Um, and they need to be comfortable with the idea of having something in the vagina. It is a vaginal device. So a very good question to ask ordinarily would be, 
have you used a tampon successfully in the past? And if the answer is yes, there's a high degree of probability that a FEMI would be acceptable. Um, and of course, there needs to be room in the vagina. So if there is uh, a grade one or two prolapse, it's probably okay to use a FEMI. But if the prolapse is encroaching on the positioning of a FEMI, if it's potentially touching the device, it might be uncomfortable and possibly even risky. So the correct positioning is very important. We'll look at the technique for positioning in a moment, but the handle should rest very tightly against the perineum underneath the labial skin fold, so it's not visible from the outside. And the discs should sit just above the perineum. So of course, the length of the stock is designed so that with the handle in the correct position, the discs will automatically sit above the perineum, um, ready to provide support in the mid urethra. So just like a tampon, same sort of positioning. Um, in the early stages, women can use water-based lubricants, pH balanced, or possible, possibly an estrogen pessary cream to facilitate entry. And especially if they are postmenopausal, there may be vaginal atrophy. The estrogen cream might help with the pitholization, which will occur ordinarily with repeated use. So it may take a couple of weeks to get used to the device as the skin toughens up. Uh, but persistence is key in the beginning. All three sizes come in the starter kit. And of course, the lady will be encouraged to trial all three sizes at home and figure out for herself which one is most effective. So the, the disc width varies from 30, 35, and 40 millimeters. The 35 millimeter option tends to be the most popular, but of course, sometimes they need smaller or larger versions depending on the size of the regional anatomy. Um, the patient will know when they've got the correct size because it will sit securely, it will feel comfortable, it should not be uncomfortable, and they should be able to urinate naturally without a need to remove the pessary. If they can't pee or it's uncomfortable, they need to downshift to a smaller size. Uh, and the efficacy results are more or less 80%. 80% of ladies will experience a significant reduction or complete cessation of leakage with the support pessary imposition. So how to insert correctly. Uh, before use, make sure the bladder is empty and then wash the hands with soap and water for hygiene reasons, of course. Take the device out of the packaging and rinse it with water. Uh, this also gives the surface less drag, making it easier to insert into the vagina. Or as we said earlier, use a pH balanced lubricant. Then find a comfortable position. If the lady's standing, slightly bending the knees may help. And using the back of the handle, exactly as shown in the image, with a slight downward tilt, insert the device into the vagina at an upward angle. And so that kind of correlates with the angle of the vaginal corridor. So push the device in until the handle rests tightly up against the pubic bone or the perineum, and then allow the labia to cover the handle. So when you've done that, as we said earlier, because of the length of the stalk, the discs should sit above the perineum, providing support in the mid urethra. Um, and then if, uh, when it comes to removal, either after exercise or maybe 16 hours later, as the patient prefers, this should grip the outer part of the handle, which is designed to be strong enough to accommodate sufficient force to pull the device out steadily and safely. So cleaning, um, the following methods are recommended. Uh, rinse with water for immediate reuse. So if you pop it in and want to pop it out and want to pop it in again, just need to rinse it with water. Um, to sterilize it or decontaminate more or less completely, boil in water for 10 minutes and let it dry in air. Or you can cleanse with water and soap, preferably using a soap specific for intimate use. So they're not going to create any irritation on the vaginal corridor. And then obviously rinse the soap away completely before allowing it to dry in air. Uh, more recently, it's been possible to use the Ephemia cleaning bag. It's purchasable as an accessory. It's not supplied in the prescription kit, but patients can buy it from iMedicare. Simply fill the bag with 100 mils of water um, together with the device inside and then microwave it for three minutes at 75 watts. And that's enough to kill um, pretty much everything that's on the surface. So the contraindications relate to silicone hypersensitivity or allergy. Um, given that it's made of medical grade silicone. And of course, do not use during pregnancy, the effects of which have not been studied, which is fairly standard for a bladder support pessary. 
it can be used during women's menstruation, um, obviously, depending on the volume of blood. By supply, um, Ephemia is available on prescription FP10 across the whole of the UK and Northern Ireland. There are regional variations. Some ICBs do not support bladder support pessaries, but on the whole, these days they do, which is great. Um, so the GP can issue a prescription on the recommendation of a clinician, the pelvic floor physio, a urogynecology specialist. And normally the patient would start with the starter kit. So they get all three sizes to experiment to see which size is, is best for them. And then they would seek to um, prescribe the single size that's most efficacious on an ongoing basis. Um, but delivery is very important because on the whole, we try to avoid the use of wholesalers, um, primarily because we want to build relationships with our pharmacists. We want them to know about and understand Ephemia and how it works, but also uh, we can supply to the pharmacist directly. So when you see a patient, we normally recommend that you give them two copies of the advice pad with the delivery instructions in top right. So the codes are important for the GP, but the delivery instructions are important for the pharmacist. They should either order by telephone or email through iMedicare directly. We'll post it straight to the pharmacy with no postal charge, or they can, if they want, order through the whole, the uh, specials division of their habitual wholesalers. Some wholesalers will say they don't have it in stock. Now, that's really not true because we don't supply to any wholesaler for stock. They either have to order it as a special order or they need to come through our Medicare. But we've never had a stock supply problem. The issue is how the patient should order and knowing that this is the, the process. Now, if we consider the cost and sustainability of Ephemia, as we saw earlier, um, one device can last 16 hours a day for three months. So imagine it's used all day, every day for three months, then at a, at a single device cost of 44 pounds, you're talking roughly 180 pounds for one year. But in reality, very few patients use it like that. They tend to use it intermittently. So the real cost, the real world cost can be much less. It can, one device could last six months or 12 months if, for example, the patient is only using it for exercise or intensive activity, maybe, maybe shopping. If we compare that with the cost of single use disposable pads or some other bladder support pressuries that maybe can only be used one or two times, you can see that the cumulative cost through time is, is much higher and also the impact on the environment. So if you were to displace the use of disposable pads completely, then you would save up to 46 kilograms of CO2 being produced into the environment. Um, so it's definitely a very cost-effective, sustainable solution. There's definitely a need for this kind of device. It can be introduced to your patients quickly and applied efficiently. It's very easy to use. Um, it can obviously have very significant lifestyle benefits to the successful user, enabling them to perhaps partake in more exercise, improve their social confidence and self-esteem, and maybe can displace the need for a surgical intervention in a patient who's not sure, or maybe a patient who's contraindicated for surgery, it can provide a long-term alternative. So we, we have lots of resources to assist clinicians. Um, we have both digital and printed copies of the clinician guide which is full of tips and tricks on how, when and when not to use Ephemia and how to use it. We also have recently produced the Ephemia uh, poster and clinician guide, which uh, is a very useful way to show the patient exactly where and how Ephemia should be positioned. All of these are available on request, including samples of the device to show the patient what it looks like, copies of the advice pad for the GP and pharmacist, and of course, patient brochures. Uh, so that brings us to the conclusion of this fairly rapid introduction to Ephemia in the context of stress and continence. You can seek further information from uh, Ephemia directly um, or from iMedicare on My Pelvic Health, or you can email us on contact at iMedicare.co.uk. We have a team of uh, full-time medical grade representatives um, all over the UK, full UK and Ireland coverage available to offer detailed technical and patient support at will. So hope that was useful and that you'll be able to join our further 
um, classes. We have Claire Bourne talking about the pelvic floor in the fourth trimester on the 2nd of October. We have Elliot Stackhouse from My Medicare doing a deep dive into the technical aspects behind the design of Ifemi and the clinical research to explain why it's so efficacious. And then we finish off with Claude Cotri looking at uh, stress incontinence in the menopause on the 14th of October. So I will stop sharing and screen sharing and try and have a look at the questions and answer those if we can. So do we have any data in comparison with other vaginal devices for SI? Not study comparing directly, but we do have our own efficacy studies. So you can then compare with the efficacy studies of other devices, which is a simple way to look at that answer. Uh, and then, of course, you get anecdotal experience from your own patients, which is generally very positive when Ifemi is applied correctly in the right context. Any other questions? Which is the best constant for order booklets and information? Um, I probably, I think that means how do you get a reliable supply of devices or, or of brochures? Well, ideally, we would post these out to you on a regular basis, but the best thing to do is contact your local rep who can either drop them in on his daily travels or we can have them posted from the office. We have plenty of all options to post out to people at any time. Oh, and someone said very informative, thank you. It's a delightful pleasure to help. And hopefully you'll find the additional courses just as useful. I appreciate being here and I appreciate your time. Um, I think that's probably enough for today. So as I said, oh, hang on, who's the rep for the black country? So that would be Mohit Mitra on um, mohit at imedicare.co.uk. And then going into the West Midlands and Wales, it will be uh, Yusuf, um, who is on wales-westmidlands at imedicare.co.uk. Um, but if anyone wants more specific details on the reps, just send us an email and we'll give you a direct connection to the rep and we'll send you links to all of the resources that we have on our website. Um, and yes, we will type all of those. <laughs> yes, uh, well, mohit, M-O-H-I-T, at imedicare.co.uk. Um, I'll just type that right now. For sake of ease. Brilliant. Okay, thank you very much, people. Um, we will click end unless we have any other questions. As I said, this will be available um, on our website to review later via YouTube and the deep dive with L8 Stackhouse will go into Ephemia in a lot more technical detail. So we've had quite a superficial approach today. Um, but hopefully that was enough to whet your appetite for the further webinars in the series. Many thanks. <laughs>